you were offered cocaine <laughs> in at a, at a tournament. I was on the practice board and this guy went, Keith, do you want a coke? I said, no, mate, I'll have a beer. He went, man, I mean cocaine. I said, no, no cocaine, I want a beer. Just get me a beer. Eric then got on the mic and said, I'll play him again for money because a light that never strikes twice and I'll beat him again. Anyway, on the day of the final, Eric told me this. He said, my dad was having a bet on every day on you. He said he was, he was laughing. People still say to me about Eric, well, should he have gone for the ball? But his answer was, if it had been 1-3-6, he would have gone for it. People said to me afterwards, you know, did he um, speak to you? I went, yeah, yeah. I said, only one sentence, enjoy it, because you only got that trophy for one year. That's all he said to me. Not even well done. <laughs> I thought, brilliant. And they said, like, and they went, if Keith wins, Keith Deller wins the Worlds again, he'll be the first millionaire dart player. But all them things are in your head. Hello, welcome to episode one of the Darts podcast. Today's guest is the 1983 world champion, Keith Della. Hi, Jack. How are you doing, mate? You right? Or captain of the Darts <laughs> Super League team. <laughs> yeah, we'll get onto that in a bit, I think. So I want to do like the first sort of question that I'm going to do to everyone. It's just kind of to ask them as an opening question, who is, who's the best player to ever play? Because a lot of people are going to say Phil. I've had a few people who say Michael or Eric. In your opinion, who do you think is the best player to ever play the game? For me, it's Phil Taylor because Phil, okay, people can say, well, the standard is better now, there's more players can play it, but Phil's averages were very consistently high all the time. And I just feel that he's won everything like 16 to, or 15, 16 times. Yeah. And he was just, a, you know, relentless. And when you think at the end, um, his last year, he won the match play and lost in the final of the Worlds. And that was when he retired. I mean, if he practiced hard now, he'd still be top eight easy, wouldn't he? I mean, he was just an absolute genius. Uh, Michael may, Michael might be the best ever, maybe in 10 years' time, when if Michael keeps winning more world titles, more majors, then we can say that. But I don't think you can say he's the best, Michael, at this time. I think Phil's record, and you've got to respect what he's won and and I just feel that he's won everything so many times that he's to me still the best of all time I would put Michael second and I'd put Eric Bristow third I mean there's a lot of differences where in our day we didn't have 38 tournaments on the floor where there's 10,000 a winner then they've got the Europe, European events they've got the majors we would have I remember I won the Worlds and then I had to go on the road and do TV work. I come back and won the Diamond Masters, and then they didn't have another tournament then for about five months. So you'd go on the road exhibitions. So we weren't as sharp. I mean, these guys have got no excuse. They don't really have to do exhibitions. The money's there for the top players, you know. So they always moan on a bit tired. Well, don't do exhibitions. Take the time off when you're not playing a tournament. So yeah, yeah. But it's a lot easier. It's a lot harder to to win but it's a lot easier to play well under pressure. Let's take it right back to a very, very young uh, Keith Della. So you grew up in Ipswich. That's right. What was your, what was your home, home life like? What were you like at school? Uh, family of four. Um, I had a brother, Alan. Uh, my mum and dad, sadly my dad's gone. My mum's still around. Uh, my mum's 88 now. Um, just went to the local school, um, comprehensive school. And... Uh, I remember when about 12 years old, my mum and dad, they played in a dart team on a Monday night at the Kingfisher at uh, Chantry Estate, Ipswich. And I started having a throw and I thought, oh, this is not bad. And I sort of started to play quite well. And uh, I think when Sid Bedell said, my mum had frying pan in one hand and darts in the other, exactly what it was like there enough, you know, she'd have the egg and chips on or something and we'd be throwing darts. And, and that's how I really sort of started, you know, and, uh, we just enjoyed playing darts. I mean, whenever I come home from school, I was playing darts. I just loved playing. It was something I really enjoyed doing at the time. And I, I mean, I used to play football. I played ba um, basketball for Suffolk. I played um, table tennis for, I played in the East of England playoffs. I was quite good at sport. And, uh, but darts seemed to be the better one for me. <laughs> yeah, I tend to find that if you're naturally good at sports, you just, you're almost straight away good at darts or you've got that natural ability to sort of the hand-eye coordination and that sort of thing but I, had, I had friends at school I was decent at football I was alright at football but I had friends at school who were really good footballers and then I'd have a game of darts with them and obviously because I'd played a lot I, I was better than them but they, they had much more natural ability than I ever had 
and it was like really quite apparent. I think there's quite a few players in the Premier League now or played high level football who are like actually decent dart players. So yeah, I definitely think there's like there's a level of well, the natural ability really, isn't there? Yeah, but, I think also <laughs> if you play in sports and you try to be competitive, yeah. It helps you when you play darts because it's the same thing. It's about trying to win, isn't it? The will to win. Well, did you, what did your friends think about you playing darts? Was that was was darts then something that you did you really shout about it? Was it something that people spoke about, or was it just it was just a, a game that people played that wasn't really that much spoken about back then? Well, no, you just used to see it on TV. You used to see Eric Bristow, John Lowe, Jockey Wilson, Big Cliff, Bobby George. You used to watch the darts on TV, but. I think when I was 14, I started to play really well. And then at 15, I won the Ipswich singles on the fives board, which was 25, 15, 10. Yeah, yeah. And I was Ipswich champion at 15. And I like that because if I always wanted to come out last, so that if I come out last, I had to go, I have to go to bed too early, <laughs> get up to school. But uh, and then 16, um, I won the Super League um, singles. And 17, I was the county champion. So in the space of really two years, I was progressed really well. And I think what helped me a lot was there was a pub called the Elbin Mills uh, on Woodbridge Road at Ipswich. And what they used to do on a Sunday is, you know, a dartboard in the bar and a dartboard in the lounge. And you'd have all county players, Super League players there, and you'd have a knockout. So if you're in the bar, there might be 16 in the bar. You, The winner of the bar played the winner of the lounge. And I used to win the tournament, you know, maybe eight times out of 10, and I'm playing best county players. So I thought... Well, I'm beating these lot, these guys a lot here. So I knew then, really, at 17, when I was a county champion, that I was doing really well and I was getting better every year. So I read your book. I thought it was very good, very enjoyable. Um, that's where's the, Where can that be? Because I got it off Amazon, but is that in shops or is it mainly yeah, online? Yeah, I think it's online, a lot of it. Um, I think that you can get it maybe in Waterstones um, or Pitch. Yeah, so it's. Uh, I think a lot of people. I'll be honest with you. I, I wasn't that bothered about doing a book. If I'm being honest, it was just that people kept saying to me, "Why haven't you done a book?" There's so many players, that have, a few players that have done books. I mean, obviously Eric, John Lowe's done a few, Bobby George, um, Wayne Mardle. Although Wayne's not really an autobiography, it's more fun about darts, really, yeah. isn't it? You know. So, but um, the other ones are the ones where really the, the champions have done well and. And they kept saying, well, why don't you do a book? And I think when lockdown happened, that was a perfect time to do it because you, you, you need to do something. So um, a gentleman called Ed, Edward Cousin Lakes, Lake um, said, I'll do the book. And Pitch took it. And uh, it's very hard. It was like, he kept sending me all this homework every time. It was like going back to school, but you've got to try and remember 40 years ago. Yeah. That was the problem. But all the stuff that was in there was true. Nothing was made up. We think, well, they're going to make it better to make it more interesting. It was just how just what 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 happened to me so yeah it was it was it was um it was fun doing but it was take a lot of time keep thinking right if i forgot anything you know it's but i think a lot of people said you know they've enjoyed it so i'm quite happy yeah i thought it was good it was a good good read um but i think for me i mean i was born in 93 so i was born 10 years after you'd even won the world championship so like i didn't wasn't around in that that time so I didn't realise how just how much you'd done even before the World Championships, the tours to America and stuff and all that. And there was just there were so many little stories in there which I found really interesting. I thought I thought was quite quite good little stories. One of the stories that stuck out was you were offered cocaine in <laughs> at, a, at a tournament and you didn't you didn't think it, you thought you thought you meant Coca Cola. Yeah. So what what was what was going on there? Well, basically, what happened? Um, Tony Sontag used was playing for England and played for London. And he said to me, do you fancy going to America? So I said, yeah, I don't mind. He said, well, you've got to use this dart with a spring loaded in. So I said, okay, I'll use it. Well, I thought at the time it's, it's not really any good American. So you can throw any dart, it should beat them. You know, it's just the, your mentality really. I was, when you're young, you're very confident. So we had three tournaments. So we had, the first one was in Lake Tahoe. And the gentleman who beat me was Dan, Dan Pasillo. Um, he was a multi-millionaire. He's got his own ski business and everything. And I lost in the final and I thought, I've got two more big events here. And he was the best player in America. The next one we went to was Austin, Texas. But on the way from, uh, from Lake Tahoe, we actually went through Albuquerque. And there was a tournament. And uh, this um, we were in this bar and there was a singles. I won the singles and me and Tony won the pairs. So we went back to this guy's um, place because we were staying the night. 
Well, he had a rattlesnake as a pet. I mean, who has a rattlesnake as a pet? Honestly, I swear mm. he got a rattlesnake. But anyway, he had a Porsche. And when you're young, you don't really take much notice, but he was driving down the road with a whiskey or brandy in his hand, you know, which he should be doing. I was sitting in the back of the Porsche. We got back and Tony Sontag said, um, can I take the car out in the desert? I want to give it a spin. So I said, well, I'm get." I said, don't, Tony, because you've had a drink. Anyway, I got out of the car. They took it out of the desert. He spun it over, spun it over. And lucky enough, a doctor was coming through the desert and he had a hole in his head that much. Bloody hell. So basically, they said if I'd have stayed in that car, it, the back was crushed a bit, so I would, I'd have been dead. So yeah. it was just, thankfully, even with having a few drinks at the bar, I knew that weren't the right thing to do. And then we, I, so I went on to Austin, Texas. Tony was in hospital for a couple of months, and um, I was playing in the final, and it was <laughs> Dan Pasillo again. I thought, God, I can't lose against him again, you know, because he was one of these, God bless America, and all this, see. So I was on the practice board, and this guy went, Keith, do you want a Coke? I said, no, mate, I'll have a beer. He went, man, I mean cocaine. I said, no, no cocaine, I want a beer. Just get me a beer. And I always remember they, um, they put American flag on the stage. And I said, well, where's, where's the English one then? And they went, yeah, oh, yeah. I went, yeah, I'll have the flag back. And that didn't go down very well. And I thought, shouldn't have done that. And, uh, and then we, I went on to Cleveland. Um, that was for the extravaganza in the f- finals, semi-final final was shown on TV and I beat Jerry Umberger in the final. So I think I come back with, you know, quite decent money and, um, you know, I gave Tony half and I said, right, you know, what do you reckon? And the, the main man went, go back and take the big boys on. And that's what I did. I went back and uh, took um, the boys on in 1982 in the Los Angeles Open. How, how did that go? Was that, so that was obviously in, in Los Angeles. What sort of players were there? Was it a lot of the main players on the on the tour? Or was it more American based? All the best players in the world: Eric Bristow, yeah. John Lowe. I think on the on the way to the final, I beat John Lowe, Bob Anderson, and Bobby George. And uh, the winner um, got a playoff in London. I beat Dennis Evans in the final. And uh, my wife, um, uh, Dennis Evans, took the name Evans because uh, uh, my wife's um, well uncle. Um, brought Dennis up so I knew Dennis well as well oh, okay. so it was um, it was strange actually because um, um, before that going back to 1979 we were in Los we would obviously won the Los Angeles Open we went on to Vegas and I had an abscess come up in my throat and I thought god I don't feel very right this doesn't sound right to me and as, it, as the two days on the Friday Saturday I, I was talking like that it was closing it was getting bigger so I thought I don't know what to do here anyway I um, had to play in the singles and I had John Lowe first round because it was only 301 best of three double in double out and uh, I couldn't speak it got that bad so I lost to John 2-0 which done me a, a massive favour I went back to the room and Dennis said look I'll come, cause I was sharing room with Dennis he said I'll come and see what you like in an hour and I wrote on a bit of paper, can you get me to the hospital? I'm choking, nearly choking here. Took me to the hospital and they had to cut the abscess. It was going into my windpipe. So I was nearly cheating death again there. So basically the, the, the surgeon said, if you'd have not come here and got on that flight, you'd have died on the way home. And Dennis Oven still says to me, do you remember when I saved your life? So this is the, you know, weird things that were happening, uh, you know, that you, it's growing up. It was lucky enough again that I felt this, this something's not right here. And um, as I said, um, went there, got Dennis in the final of Los Angeles Open now. He didn't say to me, um, you've got to let me win this one now. But actually Dennis had three darts at a double to beat me. Yeah. And he missed. I went out. That got me a playoff in London for the world. The BDO brought in... Um, for the first time, four qualifiers. And we went down to the Rainbow Room in Kensington and I played um, a gentleman from Spain first game. It was best of five, what was it? Best of five legs, best of five sets. And I went nine legs to nil, three nil, three nil, three nil. Then I had a gentleman called Len Hurd, really good player from America. He's beat a lot of the boys. And I won that three nil, one, three nil, three one, three nil. And then I had... Um, the Jim McGuigan, who was Scotland's number two at the time, because Jockey was the only Scottish player in the world, and I beat him 3 0, 3 0, 3 0. So I absolutely played out my skin and came through the playoffs 
and the other players who come through with Dave Lee, Tony Riddler, good players. So that got me a playoff for the World Championships. And that was the year you went on to win it? Yeah, um, I always remember Peter Purvis. Um, he used to be in, um, the presenter of Blue Peter, which at the time was a re- I mean, it was still going, but this was, that was a really big program at the time. And he said to me, he went, um, I hear you're the number one qualifier. I said, I'm better than that, Peter. I said, I'm world champion. I said, I'll be, I will win this tournament this week. That's just, I just believe that I was playing so good and he had 20 pound on me at 66 to one. So I think, I don't think he earned more than about 200 pounds that week. And when I was in the um, uh, studio and they were just showing a little montage of the last bit, he went, quickly, go and get my money. And I think, well, he won 1,300 pounds. And he gave me a, ma- a bottle of Magnum of Champagne because it was the 10th anniversary of the BDO. But he said, yeah. you, he just said, you looked straight in my eyes when you said it. You didn't just sort of go, I'm going to win it. You went, I'm going to win this. And he thought, well, why not? Nothing to lose. <laughs> no, worth, worth a punt. Yeah. Yeah, so the World Championship starts. Uh, again, I think because I'm a lot younger, that was not my, not my era. And just from hearing about hearing what people have said, like my granddad was into his darts when he, when he was sort of younger, um, when I was a kid. And the, the general consensus of, I think a lot of people, especially a lot of people my age, is that no one knew who you were, but that was not the case at all. The, the players definitely knew who you were going into that tournament. Um, and a lot of, okay, I guess a lot, of, a lot of officials and stuff and people around darts, people in the, in the really tight niches really knew who you were. But for me, obviously wasn't born then, but growing up, it was very much the case of Keith, Keith come out of absolutely nowhere and then he won a tournament. But that wasn't really the case. You'd played in so many things and you'd won so many tournaments as well at such a young age. So yeah, I just think that's, that's quite, a, quite, quite, an, quite an achievement to do what you've done as, sort of at, at, the age, at the age that you've done it as well. You were 23? 23, but I was, I'd, won, I'd won the Suffolk Open, the Hastings Open, where you had all players go there, Eric and them sort of players. And, I was, and then I was playing for London at the time, which was a really good side. Um, you know, Big Cliff, Lazarenko, Eric, it was really, you know, in a way it, it was sort of like people didn't live really in London, played for London, but uh, that was a great experience. I mean, I always remember going years ago, I must have been 1981, there was a place called, a pub called the Lord Brook in um, Walthamstow. And what they used to do, they would have um, one leg fails and one, and this Nicky and Tommy Gooch said, two guys went, look, we're going to take you down this pub. You're going to be playing some of the best players in the world. There was Eric Bristow, Cliff Lazarenko, Tony Brown, who was England International, Charlie Ellix, England International. And what you actually did, Jack, is that you had you, one leg fails and one. You take, it, you take it in turns to have a throw. So if you got 100, that was, say, a pound, which is like, say, five and now. Yeah. If you got a 140, that had been three pounds. So, and then the, if you won the leg, you got five pounds. So it was like probably 50, 60 pounds. So he said, look, don't worry. I said, well, I ain't got the money to play. He said, no, we're going to back you. He said, just enjoy it. Well, I won the first two. So they were happy because they, they couldn't lose. And I think that was one of, the, one of the times they noticed me because these guys were just playing for money. And uh, I walked in and won the first two. I mean, I actually beat Eric in Ipswich. He did an exhibition and I was 21 and um, they knew I was the best player in Suffolk. So he played all the players. He played 15, but he said, "We're playing. I'm playing Keith Della, the county champion, best of five, fails on one. And I beat Eric 3-2. Um, Eric then got on the mic and said, I'll play him again for money because stri- uh, Lightning never strikes twice. So they managed to get about, in today's terms, 200 pounds. And I beat him again, three two. And this is so he knew who I was definitely because yeah. you don't beat the best player in the world, best of five fails and best of five fails and one twice on a trot. So in a way, without me not thinking about it, I was sort of marking his card early doors that you know I'm no walkover. And yeah, I think let them know. And I, them sort of things happen. So it was really good for me, um, you know. And and then obviously going to Jollies, I think the first thing I thought. As long as I'm not nervous, I think I'm playing that. I mean, I was practicing seven hours a day, every day. I mean, Linda Batten, who's Linda Duffy. Now, you know, they would say, look, you can't practice anymore. You, 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 she said, you're wearing the carpet out, you know. I mean, and it was true. I mean, if you ever see her now, she'll, she'll tell you that um, 
I just practice, 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 because I knew that if I did, I'll get better and better, and and that's what I did. And in a way, they had to sort of calm me down a bit when I got to um, Jolly's because the first game was in the afternoon, and that um, that was against Nicky of Rascal. Well, the funny thing about Nicky of Rascal was the year before there was a pub called the Rising Sun at Whetstone, and I used to go down there and play. Well, I had no money, so I used to work behind the bar, and then. One this year, Nicky Braschel, Terry O'Day, about five overseas players came in to have a practice. So he went, look, if you can keep on that board, you ain't got to serve any beers. Well, I was on the board for two hours. They couldn't knock me off. And then I see the following year, I've got Nicky Braschel, and I thought, well, he couldn't beat me last year, and I'm better now. It was just like, I mean, people say, is it cocky? But it's confidence. Yeah, That's yeah. all it is. And I beat Nicky, that was 2-1. Um, and I knew once I go with Nicky, I'd be okay. Then I had Les Cable, who was local Stoke-on-Trent boy. Uh, play, he played for England, but it was five sets. And I thought, I'm, I'm okay here. And I won that 3-1. And I, actually, the support, I got pretty good support for it, maybe because I was young. Um, and then, obviously, the first big test was John Lowe in the quarterfinals. And um, funny story is that um, Eric's father, George... Um, what it was, I know it sounds silly, but there was two rooms. One was called the band room. They had all these boxes and everything. You had a dartboard. Then you had another room with a lot more room with two boards in. Well, I like to go in the band room because you knew there weren't many players going to come in there. And so did Eric. So when I played Nicky Vrashkel, George come in about 15 minutes before I was going on. He said, uh, how'd you feel, mate? I said, George, I said, that's one out of the way already. I said, I said, I played him a few times. He ain't going to beat me. He went, well, good luck, mate. And that was it. Then we got less capable. I went, oh, local boy, I said, well, he ain't got far to go when he get beat tonight, has he? He went, oh, you're confident? I went, yeah. And then it come to John Lowe. And um, and I just thought, if I can just stay with John early doors and, and you know, not get nervous. And, and I didn't. I just couldn't wait to play. And then comes George, 15 minutes before. How do you feel? I went, here comes the upset. Here comes the big upset, George. I said... Your, your boy ain't playing him in the final. And that was it. And, that, and then when I played jockey, uh, he came in about 15 minutes before every game. And when I got the jockey, I went, defending champion, bye-bye. It's me and your boy, me and you, me and your boy in the final, George. Anyway, on the day of the final, Eric told me this later on, a lot, lot of years later, when we were really good and close mates. He said, my dad was having a bet on every day on you. He said he was, he was laughing. He said he was putting like 20 pounds on. And I was always about five to one, six to one. And then I said to him, he went, um, why don't you have a bet on Keith in the final? He went, I can't bet against you. He went, no, look. He said, look, Dad, I'll win. You're still done well. But if he does beat me, you make some more money. So Eric couldn't have been as confident as he was sounding in the interview because he wouldn't have said that to George. Yeah, it doesn't sound very Eric Bristow of him. No. So that was like, you know, and then... I remember the final because um, when I got to the semis, uh, they, BBC said, if Keith beats Jockey, because Grandstand at that time was a really big programme on a Saturday afternoon. You had World of Sport and Grandstand. So they said to Tony Brown, who was playing Eric, and to Jockey that if Keith wins against you, Jockey, uh, Eric and Tony were playing three sets in Grandstand stand live because it's such a big, big event. And... Uh, which I did, and I always remember because I thought, right, it's three sets. We're starting about 2.30. I don't want to be 3-0 down. 2-1 either way, it's game on. And I was 2-0 up, and then Eric won the third set well. So that was 2-1. And then we had to wait for about hour and three quarters before we carried on again. And Terry O'Day and John Lowe um, were in the studio with Peter Purvis, and Terry said to me before, he said, how do you do your two one up I went I said he won't get four sets I said he'll get six free if he's lucky and I had seven darts to do it it, it just you know it, people, it was just so much confidence you know I've, I've been on both sides as well I've, I've been there when he, I mean I wasn't confident the following year but when I played Eric it was um, I just felt when I was I was leading I think I had a little bit too much time it was when I was when I had that leg to win six free I, I kicked him really well and Eric was about 200 behind. 
And I knew when I went for the 64, I had six darts to be world champion. And my lip was shaking and me. I could, I knew it. I was just thinking I'm world champion. I mean, I was unlucky on the second shot because they were right on the wire. But in a way, it was the best thing thing that happened to him. But when I when he won that, he went up to the, when I missed him, he went up to the camera and laughed like that, ah, like that. And then the next set, I lost 3 nil. So now we're five all. And then Eric broke me the first leg where well, you know it's like Jack when you play best of five if they take the first throw against me when you've had the darts you're in big trouble but for somehow I just pulled out a 12 15 12 to win and uh, people still say to me about Eric we well, should he have gone for the ball but his answer was if it had been 136 he would have gone for it because if you hit the treble 20 you're just going to stay there and he knew I never went to treble 19s I mean the one used to go that way really so treble 20, treble 18, there was a lot of movement and he didn't see it happening. And he thought I'd had my chance. So basically, you know, the one three, one three eight. Um, I was, people said to me, did you think you're gonna get it? No, of course I didn't. I was hoping to leave a double and hope Eric was gonna miss three at 32 and get another chance. But the treble 20, then the treble 18, and I weren't even gonna, I wouldn't have done a Rob Cross and stopped and had a look at it because <laughs> I panicked. I just went for it and it was straight in, so, but, People said to me afterwards, you know, did he um, speak to you? I went, yeah, yeah. I said, only one sentence, enjoy it, because you only got that trophy for one year. That's all he said to me. Not even well done. <laughs> I thought, brilliant. <coughs> so, you, you know, he won it the next three years after that. But I knew the following year I was going into it, and I knew I was going out early. It was horrible, because I just knew that I'd been on the road all year. I was, And Eric said, you're burnt out. And because the thing is, Eric Jockey, John Lowe, Cliff, all these players, Bobby George, they used to follow each other around all the tournaments. So once I won, everybody wanted to book me. So I was going all the time, exhibitions, and, you know, it's just too much. And then, as well as playing in the tournaments, and uh, it was sort of, I mean, I, I remember doing a thing for Channel 4, um, two days for the five, for the start, and then I was walking down with a suitcase, and they said, like, and they went, if Keith wins, Keith Della wins the Worlds again, he'll be the first millionaire dart player. And all them things are in your head. So I was, I had no chance, really. Yeah. <laughs> and Nicky Rashkel beat me. <laughs> yeah, the person who you beat the first round the year before. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's go back to the, the World Championship win. Um, so you beat, you beat um, John Lowe, Jockey Wilson, Eric Bristow. And that was 3-2-1 that was in the world at the time as well. Yep. That's, I don't think that's ever been done bef uh, before or since. No. Either. I, and even Nicky, <coughs> Ra Nicky Rashkel was number seven seed. Yeah. So four out of my five games were seeded players. But, you know, I always remember when I the semi-final and I said, well, I beat the number three, I beat the number two, three, two, one, because it was a program that used to be yeah. on. And uh, it was just confidence. I mean, it, it, I mean, jockey... Missed double 18 in the first set of the semi-final, right on the wire. And then he went double and he was sort of shaking his head a little bit. And I won that set and I thought if he'd have hit that nine, he might have won that set. But he was so, because I mean, it's 52,000 pounds. That would have been the first nine darter on TV. Yeah. And uh, he was really, um, he was gutted. And I managed to get a lead on him. And then, uh, but he was great. I mean, he said in his interview afterwards, the public don't know me, but the dark players did like you said earlier and that was true you know so i wasn't a surprise but i mean i always remember people were just having fun bets oh, i'll put a tenner on him and <laughs> it worked out okay in it, when he when he made it to the final um this is something that i didn't know until i read your book either but there, there was the, the big break in between so you played three sets and then you then you had a yeah. break and then you went off and played whatever the rest of the match match was like that had never been done before in a in a final and when at what point did you know that was going to be a, that was going to be the, the thing was it quite close to the match or did you know well in advance no what it what I said was that when we got to the semi-final stage before we played the first semi which was Eric against Tony Brown we were told that um well they they said to the uh, they told me but they told the players if Keith beats Jockey then we're going to go 230 tomorrow afternoon live on Grandstand and that's what happened so it was strange because, as you said, the thoughts are, as long as you're not 3-0 down, 2-1 either way, there's not much in it. And that's all I was thinking about. Do not go 3-0 down. Make sure you go 2-1 go up. Keep, and that's all I kept thinking. 
and I got off to a lovely start. And uh, and then I had to throw in the third set, but Eric broke me back well. You're, you're going off your break, you're two one up, and you've got, you got like nearly two hours to burn. Yeah. What, do you, what do you do in that time? Well, because I'm a big Ipswich fan, that was the FA Cup day as well, so I was busy watching the scores come in on Grandstone, funny enough, I thought I'd just been on there, I watched the football scores, and uh, and I was just chilling out, sitting there really, um, I had a sandwich I think, and uh, just sat there really, and just kept getting up and having 10 minutes, and then once the football scores come in at 5 o'clock, I knew then about 5.40 that we were going to start walking on stage again, and that's when I started practicing full full again because I knew I practiced enough as it was and that worked really well I mean because I remember the morning every all through the week I was at at seven o'clock I was on the practice board and I stay on that till like midday five hours and uh, people were coming down at breakfast at nine o'clock how long have you been here I went two hours you must be mad I thought not really I'm practicing and uh, on the day of the final Linda and John um, said you can't practice for five hours before you get it. You're playing this afternoon. I said, no, all right. I said, we'll come down at eight o'clock <laughs> instead of seven. But I actually played about half eight. To, no, was it half eight to about eight to about half, about ten, half ten. Then I went and had a shower and then I come back and we went over the venue, I think about 11 and uh, carried on playing. But when you're young and that, I just could, I could play for hours, hours and hours, you know. So that was the way I prepared, but uh, I just thought, as long as I practice enough, I mean, you know, it's like anything, you, you, you've got to put the work in, but some players don't like practicing much. I mean, Gary Anderson, when I go and watch Premier League, he sits down half the time, but I think that suits Gary. If you played too much, it most probably wouldn't work for him. So yeah. everyone's different. The one three eight. The whole, I mean, there, there's there's a lot to the shot. There's a lot to the moment that kind of like sticks out. It's the whole Eric chose to go the wrong go the the the, the eighteen route instead of the bullseye route. Um, he's on he's on one two one. He goes for the treble seventeen first start, hits a single, leaves himself one oh four. Then he hits a treble eighteen. Now, in your mind, do you think it was after the treble went in that he chose to chose to switch his shot, or do you think he was always planning on leaving thirty two over over bullseye? Yeah, I think it was after the second shot because he was looking at 51, that leaves 70, treble 18, double eight. So he was thinking the 51, 54, double eight. When he didn't hit the 54, then obviously that was, or did he hit the 54? He hit, hit the 54. Oh, sorry, he hit the 54. Yeah, hit 54 so he hit the 17, leave. didn't he? Yeah. Sorry, he had the 17, left 104, that's right. And then he hit the treble 18 and I think, I don't know really. I mean, I think he was thinking about taking the shot out, 51, 54, double eight. But when he hit the 17, I think that's possibly, you might be right. He might have thought then I'm just going to lay up triple 18, 18, leave 32 maybe. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, I know the game's very different today, but I, if, if, you, if your plan after the first start was always to leave a single single dart at a double instead of going for the bullseye, I'd have thought he'd have gone somewhere, he'd gone 20s or something. Yeah. So... Yeah, so looking at it from a person who's in the mind of today's game, my my opinion of it would have been that he might have changed after the, the treble 18. Yeah. Instead of switching down to the bullseye, he thought, hey, he's not, not going to go. Um, and then the 138. So the 138 goes in. And it's quite it's quite a niche outshot. Like it's a really uncommon outshot to do. Um, do you think that if that 138 was a much more common outshot, like a 141, do you think that would have changed the way that you would yeah, that you were known your popularity the way that you've gone on to continue your career known as Mr 138 if that was a 141 which gets taken out all the time on nine darts and stuff do you think, do you think just the, the the rarity of the 138 made a big difference yeah I think you might be right because you say 141 you go for 81 a lot don't you treble 19 if you want the double 12 or you treble 15 double 18 so because you play that number okay but 78 doesn't come up as, as much as 81 does it because of the 140 140 so yeah I think so I think that um, it was strange because a couple of stories went after I hit the 138 um, when we played golf uh, to, when we what well, we do when Eric was alive City West for the it would always be Way Mardle Russ Bray myself and Eric and I always put 138 on the ball and I still do anyway um Mine just went in the light rough, and me and Russ Bray are over here. And I went, 
Russ watches. I went, Eric, I said, uh, is that my ball, mate? Hold on, pal. You so and so. He threw it in the woods. <laughs> and who is it? Um, his mate Richie said, Oh, he said, we're in Tenerife. And um, Eric would get the bus to the beach. He weren't going to get taxis or. So he went for the bus. And the bus come round. It was number 138. And he went, No, not getting on it. He wouldn't get on it. You know, that's what they told me. <laughs> so, but uh, I actually played him in Ipswich, Corn Exchange, about three months after winning the title. And Tony Green was the MC. Uh, he used to do Bullseye with Jim Bowen. And it was five rematch. Was another rematch, and it was uh, we had about cool, over a f- thousand people there. It was five sets all, but it was one leg all, and I went one three eight to go two legs to one up. And I can't repeat what he said in my ear. Oh, I can't. I and can't I went imagine. on, and I went on one three one, and I won the game, and I took a one three eight out. And then there was another story. If you ask Daryl Gurdy, we, me and Eric would do an exhibition at his local club, and the family come down, and we were just having a dartboard like like here at Morton Hall on the side and Eric was going out to have a fag and he went and the, and the MC Daryl was watching me like and the MC went Keith you're required 138 Eric stopped and went he stood next to Daryl and went go on in let's see how good you are and I went triple 20 triple 18 double 12 and he mumbled and went out and it's just weird like you know but he did get me back because um, when we do the photographs or when we did if I did them first I put Keith Della 138 so I think the third night, he was left to me. He put Eric Bristow, MBE, went win that one. <laughs> <laughs> so during during that tournament as well, you were using the, the, the spring-loaded dart points, sort of as they were. Yeah. Um, and that was something that was introduced to you when you were over in, in America, right? Well, the guy was from um, Norway, I think, and Tony Sontag um, was the one who said, if you go to America, you've got to throw this dart. It's a spring-loaded dart. I went, what's that? He went, oh, the point just moves. He said, it's supposed to have hit a wire, it'll go back in, which never going to happen, is it? I mean, it's not a boomerang. So I went, that's fine. And I used them, and actually, um, I thought they're quite nice. And I didn't really take notice, because you know the ones that I've seen on Euro where they're very thin, in it? Yeah, they like wobble and, and, and stuff. And it's, it's horrible, isn't it? It goes like that. So that was really off-putting, but I didn't really notice it because you don't, when you're throwing it, it weren't really moving around. It was only when it hit the board. Yeah, watching it back, you couldn't tell that there was no, a the dart. No, you couldn't tell. So it was, it was a gimmick for me, I think, but it was a good one because they, they everyone wanted to buy them. Yeah. But the trouble is, this, you had, you had, what you did, you put, you put the point in, then you put the spring in, a little spring, and then you put a screw in, screw it and then you've got to put your stem in and then you put your flight in but once the spring went they went solid so people used to say to me have you got any springs i went springs i went no why he went well my springs got in me dar i went i don't carry springs i only put, I only carried a food just in case mine went but yeah it was it was a good gimmick because it went in all the shops so i was quite happy but um once um i think i was in there for 15 months it was only two catalogs in berry and one was Argos and the other one was Index. And Eric had this really cheap, useless dart in there. It was awful. And they had my spring loaded. So it was a really good thing for me. And then when I lost the title, they come out. So that was when the money trail stopped on that one. But uh, it was great, you know. But people people still talk about it. I went on Twitter yesterday, you know, spring loaded. It's, it's um, strange. But, um, yeah, so we're... I'm, you know, might not have a spring-loaded dart, but the dart company might, you know, hopefully in the next few months, think of something we might do. So watch your space. <laughs> and then they, they got banned as well for a period of time. I mean, you can, use, you can use them now, but were you using them when they got banned? They tried to ban them when I had them, um, but it, it soon went. I, I, I didn't really know much about it. They, they were trying to ban the spring-loaded dart, but... Oh, so it never really affects you anyway? No. Oh, that's all right. So... It was, what, about a year later is when John hit the nine darter against you. That's right. It was in the world match play at Slough. Is it the Falcon Rooms? Um, it was the quarter final of the world match play, and the score at the time was two sets to one to John, and it was one leg all. And then John hit the nine darter, because as soon as he went, I mean, standing behind, he just didn't look like, I know he's, he's hit it, so he never looked like, he just didn't move. His throw was unbelievable. And... Treble 17 went in 
and then I knew the crowd might go triple A, and I just went like that. Don't don't put him. Let him have a go at it yeah, because yeah. to me, you know, it's nothing. It's such an achievement. It had never been done because Dave Lanning, Dave Lanning used to have a bet on it all the time. He used to bet that John Lowe would do the nine data, and he did. Not him specifically, I think so. Yeah, because um, you know, I think he saw John's throw was so rock solid, and uh, Jockey had lost a round before. <laughs> And John come up and in the idiot. I mean, the next leg, I went 12 darts to make it two legs all. And I'm thinking, come on, nick this set here. I'm two sets all. John went 12 darts for the match. Do you know what? It felt, Jack, like they were 24 dart legs because after that nine, yeah. 12 and 12 didn't mean nothing. And Jockey had lost a round before, so Jockey wasn't in a good place. I think Lowy come in and went, oh, who's going to get me a drink? And I don't want to tell you what Jockey said, but uh, it was unbelievable achievement i mean people said did you want to get it no i want to get him to have a chip because i want to win the match don't i yeah. i want john to miss a few darts here and i go and win that leg and then i've got the throw for two sets all so no i didn't want him to win that but i wanted john to have a fair chance i mean i think now it's a lot harder with the crowds now to get quiet but there again the big money's in the game now so they've just got to put up with it uh, let's go through let's go forward a few years probably like nine years or so and then the PDC forms, and you're one of the members who who split away. At, at, at that time, I guess that was at 90, end of 92, start of 93. So you would have had your oldest daughter at the time, and yeah. Matt would have been like just born, I guess. About yeah, that. Matt was 92, Lauren was 91. I mean, I think it, it come to a good time for me because, I mean, I mean, the British Professional, when I won that, that was on BBC all week, and I'd be later in the final, and that was... At the time, the Worlds and the British, they were the, and the Masters, World Masters, they were your three big tournaments. And uh, so that was a real big, big event. And the, the, the problem was my world ranking wasn't as good. But if that were the British professional, even though they reckon it was the second hardest one to win because it was seven days on TV, if that had been a world ranking event, I'd have been all right. But it was only British ranking points. So it didn't do my world ranking any good, but it, it did me good because it was live on TV, the final. And then I had, a, I had a couple of quiet years, bad years. And then really I was out. I think I'd gone out of the top 16. And then they said, we've got a chance to break away. Even though I was out of the top 16 just, the, 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 my problem was is when you get a lot of points in one, like we had, the Worlds and the World Masters were the massive points. So if you had a bad run in them too, you lose so many of your points. Like Not like today now where you can over two years you have two bad tournaments like that and you're you're in trouble and that's what happened to me and then i think you lose a bit of confidence it came along the um the split and it was a oh, i didn't like it because we thought it was going to court and uh you know that was well it did go to court but i was i was about number seven to speak at the, and oh god i was so nervous and uh, I know Eric spoke, and, uh, I think Rod Harrington did. And there, there was a lot of worry, you know, people were saying you could lose your house, you know. I don't think that was going to happen. I think we were backed okay, but we would have, it could have hurt us financially quite bad. So it was a risk, um, but it was a risk. The problem is, Jack, is that for a lot of the players, it was only the likes of Eric Bristow, John Lowe, Bobby George, Cliff, um, jockey that we used to get like 100 exhibitions a year with a brewery now what was happening was because we were we had 12 tournaments on tv we went down to free all of a sudden sponsorship was coming down so all of a sudden 100 shows a year brewery went down to 20. yeah i, I remember with with unicorn at the time my money was going to be halved which you can understand you're not on tv now and it was really tough even though unicorn did stick by it but i mean it was worrying at the time and so and i think other dark companies with the players were having the same um questions asked so in a way we were getting forced into a corner we kept saying to ollie you know ollie you've got to get more tv and uh, it wasn't going to happen and then all of a sudden sky come along and said we'll guarantee you free free tournaments well for me i'm back on tv and i knew then I'm going to have a, quite a few good years on TV. So it, it was really good for me at the time. People said about Bobby George, why didn't he come over? Bobby was happy. Bobby 
was a good business businessman at his you know place his lakes he didn't really want to um he stayed where he was and that was bobby's choice mike gregory was was the one who sadly just died my i i like mike um he was definitely coming with us he then got scared that he was gonna lose his house and we could say you won't lose your house but you know you we could get hurt a bit but not silly and then without telling this he was gone back to the bdo so we were outside with the placards it was like honestly that was embarrassing we're all holding these placards up you know outside lakeside and mike was in there and none of them would speak to him then about five years down the line we're at a tournament and mike came along and they all ignored him but i didn't i just said hello mike how are you mate i just thought life's too short for things like that um and and, uh, and i said to him you, you you made a big mistake mike because he won the first tournament bdo and they i think he thought they were going to treat him like a king they were just going to wait until he lost and bye-bye you know they what they didn't care that was just a good thing for him but it was really awkward for me because my sister-in-law um ollie that's her uncle when ollie was alive and uh and so i knew the family well i used to go to family places i mean i'm i'm going down to devon in a couple of weeks to ollie's son oliver going down there and i knew the family really well and i was at the court once and i thought i can see ollie there and i got to ignore him and i thought and i kept saying to people it's very awkward for me because you know i knew i'm, I'm a bit close to the family but i had no choice you know i had to do it I mean, I was the only one that spoke at Ollie's funeral. They asked the family, said, will you speak at Dad's funeral? So, you know, that was an, an, a nice honour for me, really, because, uh, you know, and there was a lot of dart players there. So it was a really tough thing, but my career and the, my, my, you know, players like Alan Warren and people like that, they still work for a living. So really, they were still going a good income. But we were really, it's not like today, if we didn't have the exhibitions... You couldn't really earn a living out of darts because there weren't enough tournaments to earn the money. So let's go forward a few years. Um, you become one of the PDC spotters. So what what is the what's the general job of a spotter? Um, the general job of a spotter is that you I sit in a truck um, with the producer, the director, the PA, and well, when we used to have cameras, especially with Sky, I mean ITV still do, but when we with Sky. You had one camera that would take the top half of the board and the other camera guy to the right would take the bottom. So say, for instance, um, uh, your opponent wants tops and you want 123, Jack. I'll go treble 19, treble 16, double 9, treble 19, 16, bull. If he hits a 19, he'll go treble 18, bull. So once I call it, each camera knows if it's treble 19, he'll just go across to the 16s. If it's an eight, if it's a nineteen, the guy's waiting for the treble eighteen. If, he, if it goes up, I go treble eighteen. Stay there, you know. And if he hits a single, treble eighteen leaves double sixteen. So I have to call the shots, like I will tomorrow at Newcastle. And the, <laughs> it's not easy sometimes with Johnny Clayton. And yeah. Johnny is, is a nightmare because you just know that you should be going this way now, Johnny. I mean, it was funny last week with uh, Wayne. Wayne, two of them, Wayne, Joe Cullen and Clayton, both what, I think, three zero eight. Cullen went the right way and Johnny Clayton didn't. <laughs> so, and he hit one the other week. He hit, um, he what, 30, 34, uh, 74. So I've gone, uh, he's got one dart left in his hand. I've gone treble 14, because he's a 32 player. He's gone treble 13. And I said, uh, the camera went, what happened there, Keith? I went, well, Trevor 19 leaves 35. I said, that's not the right way to go. <laughs> I said, he's miscounted. And there was another one that Johnny done that was funny. He wanted, um, oh, God, what was it? And he should have gone for a double 16 with last art in his hand. And he's looking to the bottom right. I've gone, single 10. He, want, he thought he wanted 42. Yeah. And the camera went, He's gone single 10. And the guy, and the director went, how did you know? I said, well, if you look at, it's double 16, I said, but he won't look in bottom left. I said, so I know Johnny wants 42 now because that's what's he's, what he's thinking. And then, and the, the hardest part, Jack, now is that, when, like I say, but Eric, go for the ball or don't go for the ball. Some of them now, a lot of the times now, they, they lay up. Then another time they go for it, and when they're not the public players, not on a finish. 
So you, you have to watch your eyes. So when I sit in the truck, I've got the screen and I've got the TX that you'll be watching at home. Yeah. To the right, I have camera one, which is the eyes. At the bottom, I have the fruit, which is all the averages, the scores. And then I have the PDC score. Then I have a full board on another screen. So like when I'm watching, like when I'm doing it tomorrow night, especially Michael Smith, I have to watch camera one a lot when he's throwing because he switches quick. So that's very important. And I just used to watch. And then if it's a finish and I think they could go different combinations then I have to, I watch the eyes first and I've got to watch the full board. So it, it's, it's hard because it's live. And I've, in a space, look, if you imagine Michael Smith, how long does he take to throw a dart? One something seconds? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got to do that. And if he wants a certain checkout, I've got to look at it, tell the director in about half a second. So it's not as easy as people think. Um, but myself and Colin Lloyd do it with Sky. Um, and uh, it's, it works well. It works well. So the, are the, are the cameramen, like, I guess at this point they must be, but they must be quite clued up on on their numbers to an to extent as well, or, or not at all? Not all of them. I mean, we've got one um, camera guy uh, on the remote, Pete, and he's pretty good. He's pretty good with the numbers. Some of the others are not <coughs> not as clued up, which is it's hard. I mean, yeah. it's not your sport. I mean, they just work on darts one night, and then tomorrow night or the next night, they could be doing football or something else. But there again, their job is just to make sure they get the shot that I call. So... You know, the camera guys that used to do Sky, that do ITV now, um, Chris, um, Daryl, um, they, they've done it for so many years that they know shots. So that's really helpful. I mean, I can talk to the director in between throws and they hear that and that gives them a little bit more of a heads up. So, but yeah, I've been doing it now, of course, since, well, 90, was it 93 was the split? Yeah. And so it'd be nearly 30 years next year. So you just you've done it all the way from. I've done then. it from from the start, yeah. Really? Yeah, thirty years. Yeah. yeah, didn't know that. But I enjoy it. It's, but I just think God, some of them. I mean, the worst one I ever had was Eric Claris. He used to play for Belgium. He was a sixty-five, treble thirteen, double thirteen. I mean, who's going to call that? <laughs> I remember him. I got I got fined for two. I got fined two hundred and fifty pounds. I don't know. I put this in the book, but. I played Eric Claris, you know, like the UK Open that used to be regional, used to go to pubs and that to, yeah. you know, do what to qualify and exit. And I had him in the second round and uh, I wanted 36, I think, or for, top, tops or 36, it was four all, and he wanted 100. He goes, triple 17, I thought, God, he's miscounted here, happy days. He went, triple 17, single 17, double 16. And turned around to shake me out and I went, 51. I said, you so-and-so. <laughs> and the, Tommy Cox, the tournament director, heard me basically tell him what I thought of him. I got fined. And I always remember, I um, I said, I'm not paying the fine. I said, you can't expect me to pay a fine when that idiot done that. You know, like I was really having a go. And uh, that this happened in about April. I get a phone call from Barry Hearn. It must have been about three weeks before the match play. He went, oh, Keith. I went, hello, Barry. How are you, mate? He went, yes, mate. He said, looking forward to the match play? I went, Kh. I said, yeah, I love that tournament, mate. It's the best tournament. Well, he said, you better get that check off. He said, if not, you'll be watching it. I went, where do I send it? <laughs> he just said it in a, in a very nice way, but I got the hint straight away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he went some weird ways, Eric did. I mean, he was a nice guy, actually, but uh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, the ways he went. I mean, you wouldn't go that way. I mean, you're giving yourself one dart, really. Yeah. But that's the way he liked. And uh, when I had to spot for him, I thought, my God, here we go. Now I've got to think of any possible ways it can go. Yeah. Because it's just ridiculous. Yeah, because even in, in, well, more more frequently, uh, more recently, there are a lot, a lot of players who sort of, I mean, they're made, the, the, the routes that they go make sense, but they're not the same routes that people used to go back in the day. Um, it, did you have to ever have to like go around with a pen and paper and ask people what their sort of their yeah. shots were? It's like Sulovic being the main one with a leaving uh, double 14 on yeah. everything you can. I've got a pad like tomorrow. So I've got all different checkouts down and they're just a good guy. I mean, the thing about Mentor is I've sort of worked it out over the last few years. He plays 32 a lot now, but if he wants 46 and he's playing you and it's four legs all and you're on tops, he would not go 14, double 16. He would go 18 
double 14 because he knows he's got two at his favourite double. But he knows 32 is a better double breakdown. But if it's whenever it was really a crucial dart or two darts and there was a chance of going, he'll go to the double 14. But when he's not under so much pressure, he'll, he'll play 32. So you just seem to, I always put there 70, triple 14, double 14, question mark, triple 18, double 8. So I just put them both down. I mean, I, one shot I don't, I just don't agree with it. Johnny does. I, mean, I don't know why he does it. He wants 118. He starts. He starts on treble 18. Yeah, Rob Cross did that in the final leg at the Europeans this weekend to win it. To win it. I he just went, yeah, single. Yeah. See, hit single 18, then up not going out. But yeah, I, I agree. I, don't, I think that's you, horrible. Because if you hit treble 18, at least 64, and then he's going to go treble 16, double eight, and then you're going to go 14 ball. But yeah. treble twenty, you got you got a shot, you got two shots at a treble to lead a double. Yeah, but you know it's it's the way he likes to go. I know he loves thirty two, but I think sometimes when it's really crucial, you've got to give yourself an easier route. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the only the only way that it makes sense is if you truly believe that you've got more chance hitting that bullseye than you do double nineteen on that shot. Yeah, if you, if you in your mind believe that, then I I agree with the shot, but. But, you know, he's, to me, he's an unbelievable dart player. I just think he's fantastic for our game. Um, he smiles. He's always, he's always smart. He's like a smiling assassin, isn't he? Yeah. He smiles away, then he goes, 140, 140, 140 out. Hey, lovely, thank you. But I, I think he's been great for, for our game, and he's, I don't think you can get a nicer guy than Johnny. So, next up is the World Seniors. Um, you played in one a few, what was that, a couple of months ago now? That was um, February? F- yeah, February. And um, I guess, well, I guess it's quite obvious to me that your practice went from... Did, were you practicing a lot before any of that had been announced? Or, or was it or was practicing darts not really a priority at the time? Well, um, I, I knew about May time before, so... I had a good seven months, so straight away I got my garage all done out, put a board in, and uh, was practicing three or four hours a day, and I thought, a lot of these won't be doing that, and I thought, that's handy. And I thought, that'd be that'd be enough, because we weren't doing exhibitions, because it was COVID. And uh, I was playing really well, and I really felt good, and I always remember that Russ Bray come with me, and I... And I said to Russ, he said, yeah, you know, hardly a drink of you. I said, not much. I went, Russ, I'm, I'm practicing in the garage all the time, mate. 140s, 180. I said, I don't need it. <laughs> I was afraid I, I was out of the loop for too long. I stood on that walk on and the camera went on me and I went, oh, my God. <laughs> and I was nervous. I was nervous. And people say, it didn't look like I said I was nervous. And uh, I got it. I didn't think, was it eight years since I played on TV? That was a big difference, and I think it showed with the likes of Fulton played well when he won it. Kev Painter was still doing things; he won it. Uh, Martin Adams, you know, look at Phil. Phil wasn't his best, yeah. And I think really that was um, that that showed as well. And uh, straight away, that was when obviously. I come to play f- with your team, Jack. And I said to me, lad, I said, I've got to get back to playing like Super League, try and play in a f- couple of competitions and hopefully the exhibitions will kick in. And I must admit, when I played the first Super League game, I was nervous. I didn't want to say it, but I thought, oh my God, I ain't done this for years. And I really enjoyed it because it's a good standard of darts. I was quite surprised. I didn't think it'd be as good as that, but there was some, I mean, we played one team, the last one I played, they had Andrew Gilden, Stephen Burton. I mean, these boys yeah. are playing on the main tour. They normally have Brett Clayton play them as well, but he, he wasn't there that week. They're a hell of a side, they are. Yeah, and we got a draw that night, didn't we? Yeah. And that was a good good night. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, one guy beat me 4-1 in the Super League. I mean, I missed darts at doubles, but sharpness. And what gave me a bit of confidence for, for the, this week is I played in the Stone Market Open. And I played Gary Butcher. I beat him. Um, I was, I mean, Russ come along to watch, and he said, "God, you're playing well." I mean, I was I, a couple of legs. I went one, one forty, one seven four, one three one. And I thought, you know, and the game I lost was to one of our, one of our boys, Ash. Oh yeah, yeah. Last sixteen, he, um, I went, he went fifteen. Well, he, I went twenty five. He went ball. He went fifteen. I went fifteen. He went fifteen. I went fourteen. He went thirteen. He went eighty seven after nine, and I thought. Russ said to me, he went, what a game. And 
Jack Main was on the next board and he went to Jack, oh, if Keith had played any U2, he said, if I can hammer you two, you know, and I, I played well. And it was just about your bottle, really. I mean, when I played Larry Butler, I knew that he was a bit worried because party, they said Keith's been practicing, he'll be ready for you. And he didn't play as well against me uh, as he did the first. He played better in his first match. Yeah, yeah. But I gave him chances. That was the reason. I mean, I, I had the leg to win the match and went off 40, and he went 45. I thought, good. I went 60. He went 180 and broke me. But I think playing in the Super League when I could, I played in some exhibitions now, and I, I feel more comfortable um, going up Saturday. I mean, Bob, Bob was my bogey player in the 80s. Every time I played him, he beat me by bit once. I mean, I'll be two sets up and he'll go one five six to save the match. It was ridiculous. But that was a long while ago. You know, I mean, I think the last two times I played Bob, it was in Butlands in front of about 2,000 people and I think I won pretty comfortable. But, you know, Bob might think that's a great draw for him, but I'm quite happy as well. So it's, um, we know it's, I mean, we were in Scotland <laughs> a couple of weeks ago and, uh, we're having a right good laugh about it all. But as I said to Bob, I just want to go up there and play really well. If you beat me, good luck to you. Or if someone else beats me. But if I go up there and play rubbish, then that, that's when it hurts. You know, I, I want to go up there. I'm, I'm be, I'll be surprised I don't play well. You know, I feel that my darts are going in well practice. So, you know, up to Newcastle, then I should be down at Camberley on Friday on that board for three hours in the hotel room. And then I should go over and watch the darts. But... I'm just looking forward to it. I mean, it's not so much pressure for me or Bob, L Lowy. It's The pressure's really on Phil. He should be winning these. He's still the greatest. Robert Thornton. Um, you've got Wayne Jones who's been playing on the tour. Yeah. David Cameron. Um, Martin Adams. These boys have been playing all the time. So they, they should be doing... Even Lisa Ashton. I mean, God, you watch her play. Lisa really is... Uh, Playing a lot, you know, she plays on the main tour. So the pressure is, is not so much for us to win, but it's for me, it's still that I know that if I can take that practice ball, and I know everyone says that, but if I do, then I know they're going to have to play well to beat me. And that's all I want to try and do. And then whatever happens, happens, don't it? Right, I think that'll do it. Thanks very much. I Thanks, really Jack. appreciate it. Hopefully I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Right, that is episode one. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Just like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys later. Goodbye. Cheers, mate. Well done, mate. Cheers, Jack.